Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Ocal, here with you every Tuesday and Thursday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well, the NHL on ESPN YouTube. Breaking news, oh. as our buddy Kevin Weeks would say, breaking news, breaking <laughs> news. Where were you, Greg I'm Wyshynski? Tr- I'm, tr- I'm trying to get down to Weeks, to, to Weeks level on the camera yeah. here. I'm trying to just give the, the Weeks to the people on YouTube. Where was there I, Ardo? You, Where was you that? got you got the right appropriate forehead level for that. Good Thank job. You. Where you. were you? You will always remember this moment. Where were you, Greg Wyshynski, when you found out that the musical act for the stadium series will be the Jones Brothers? Uh, I was uh, watching Good Morning America, obviously, where Commissioner Bettman uh, made the announcement after spending his entire day in Bristol, Connecticut earlier this week. And what fun we had. With the commissioner on ESPN, didn't we, kids? Uh, this is you. You and I talked about the stadium series thing and whether we were going to talk about it on the drop or not. And and your level of excitement and, and anticipation as to who this musical act was going to be to play uh, during between periods of the Flyers Devils game was off the charts, as was mine. So when I found out it was the Jonas Brothers, I have to admit I was a little disappointed. <laughs> No, that's oh, no. not to say the Jonas Brothers aren't great. And it's not to say they aren't popular. They were selling out arenas. They played Yankee Stadium. They played Dodger Stadium. They're very popular. But for the commissioner of the National Hockey League to go on ESPN and be like, you guys got to watch Good Morning America tomorrow morning. There's going to be a big announcement about the musical act. I was thinking one thing. And I was thinking it, the game was in New Jersey. I was thinking the Devils were in the game. And I was thinking it was either going to be Bruce Springsteen or Bon Jovi is what I was thinking. Mm. Tell me how old you are without telling me how old you are. Listen, I, this is the same league that had Billy Idol play the Winter Classic. Okay, so I understand who is I'm making not... these decisions. I did not think it'd be the Jonas Brothers. Now, I... I, I understand this. The hype of this thing threw the whole thing out of whack. If they just put out a release that said it was going to be the Jonas Brothers, I would have been fine with it. I like their music. I don't exactly like what Joe did to Sophie Turner, but I like their music. But the problem is, Arda, is that what you what they essentially did was it's like when you're a kid and there's a giant box under the Christmas tree and you're like, what toy could be in the giant box? And then you open it up and it's a chair for your office. And you're like, chairs are functional. I need a chair. But I thought it was going to be something a little bit more toy oriented. You're saying the Jonas Brothers are a chair for your office because (laughs) you are a middle-aged man that loves Bruce Springsteen and Bon Jovi. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I'm saying Jersey lineage-wise, those would be the acts I would think. But it doesn't matter. The Jonas Brothers is a good act to get for an NHL event, regardless of whether you like their music or not. To me, for many people, they're on par with the people you mentioned, if not more important to them. I don't want to be a hater. I, I am, as you know, a, a make the tent as big as possible to get as many people watching hockey as possible. This could very well bring in somebody who isn't going to watch the game to watch the game, and that's great. My my point of contention is that, one, I think based on the way that the NHL was treating this announcement, both internally and externally for the last few months, I feel like maybe if Springsteen didn't get sick, it could have been him. That's my theory. That's my Charlie Day at the string wall theory that it may have been Springsteen and they had to go to the Jonas's instead. And two, I'm not going to be convinced otherwise that the only reason they did this is so they could the Devils could tweet out the Jonas Brothers, Hughes Brothers meme that they did when the announcement was made. Hilarious video, though. Kudos to the social media team, the content team. I thought that was funny and they were capitalizing on a popular meme. So... Good on them. Well, let's agree to disagree on this. Let's move on to uh, news in the NHL. Moments after the St. Louis Blues lost to the Detroit Red Wings on ESPN as part of our Tuesday doubleheader, head coach Craig Berube was fired by the organization. Drew Bannister from the AHL affiliate Springfield Thunderbirds is now the interim head coach. Craig Berube spent six seasons with the Blues, won a Stanley Cup, the franchise's first Stanley Cup, and has the second highest winning percentage in franchise history. The team on a four-game losing streak, knocking on the door of wild card contention. Your yeah. reaction to Craig Berube being fired? 
You know, the the coach's hot seat came out today on ESPN, and originally I had Berube and DJ Smith as the only two in the scorching hot category. Uh, obviously removed Berube after he was fired. Uh, and the reason for it was that it was pretty obvious that the, the Blues weren't going to be able to do anything with the roster significantly, and Doug Armstrong wasn't going to fire himself, which leads you to believe that it's always going to be the coach that eventually play, pays the price. Um, the Blues are 26th in goals per game. Jordan Cairo is shooting 5.7% as five goals in 27 games after scoring 37 last season. The power play is beyond pathetic. Arda, when Berube was fired, the power play had seven goals in 83 attempts, okay? Their penalty kill has eight goals. Never have a power play that's outscored by your penalty kill, people. <laughs> Um, so there was a lot of writing on the wall for Ruby, for Ruby to get fired. I did receive, I'm going to play a little er Elliot Friedman now for a second. I did receive a text today, Arda, that did say mm -hmm. that what if it was a mutual conclusion between Doug Armstrong and Craig Berube to have him move on from the team because it wasn't going to get any better. That's why they shared a beer. There's my Elliot Friedman for the day. Um, but I don't know. Now, you have to do that every show now. You have to do an Elliot's corner every sure. and, show. And, 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 I, and then I received another text that said, don't go there. Um, so, yeah, I'm just <laughs> I'm just saying the possibility uh, is that they both agreed that maybe this wasn't working anymore. And it wasn't like Doug Armstrong putting his foot down and saying, you're the problem. You got to go. Um, but what did you think of the firing? What did you think of the firing? The timing was interesting. Kind of a late night uh, kind of situation. They didn't wait till the next day. Uh, we literally did a studio update for it in the second half of our double header is kind of mm -hmm. like took over and in, instead of the Connor verse, which is the, was the big storyline of the night, all of a sudden this comes out. So you're scrambling to give the news to the viewing audience. Um, the first thing I thought of, well, a a after processing the news, the blues have a history of new coaches mid season working out well for them. Look no yeah. further than their Stanley cup run. So more generally, though, with Drew Bannister coming in from the AHL affiliate, Craig Berube being let go here as we approach a third of the season in, or approaching half, I mean, we're only about a month or two away from that point. How successful do you think this coaching change will be? Well, I mean, based on what we've seen this, this season already with John Hines and, and Chris Doblog, maybe it's the spark they need. Look, it's the kind. It's the same kind of situation. Like at some point, the power play is going to get better. At some point, Jordan Cairo is not going to shoot five point seven percent. Like there are metrics right now for the Blues that are going to improve. And plus, they're again within spit and distance of a playoff spot anyway. But but the problem right now for St. Louis isn't coaching, and the problem is not necessarily what Jordan Cairo is doing, what the power play isn't doing. The problem is that the roster isn't that good. The problem is the roster isn't of a playoff quality. And watching Doug Armstrong's press conference this week, I watched a general manager doing the, the principal Skinner meme from The Simpsons. Is it me? No, it's the kids that are wrong kind of thing when he's looking at this roster. The, this, the hardline stance that he took on the Alex Petrangelo contract when he was a free agent that eventually had him look over and see if the grass was greener in the desert is the thread that unraveled the sweater. That was the moment in which this team started to kind of stumble down the stairs. Um, the moves he's made since they won the cup haven't made the team better. The contracts that he's signed since winning the cup have been a, a, a series of disasters, a bunch of full node trade clauses for a defense core that stinks. Um, it's The problem is not coaching, it's construction. And, mm -hmm. and maybe, 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 all of the people in the media, especially the national media, that tend to treat Doug Armstrong better than other GMs, probably for reasons, uh, will take a hard look at this roster and say it's been mismanaged because it has been mismanaged. And and I think that if you if you really take a hard look at where the Blues are and where they're headed, it's it's much more of a problem with the construction of the roster than it is anything that Craig Bruby did behind the bench. So to our point here, the fourth time under Doug Armstrong that the team has changed head coaches mid-season in each of those previous three instances, the team's points percentage improved significantly under the new coach. And the Blues not only made the playoffs, but won a series, of course, won a Stanley Cup in an instance as well. Uh, is this the last card that, Doug, to your point about everything you said about Doug Armstrong, is this the last card he has to play? I think so. You know, he mentioned in his press conference the hourglass kind of being 
the sands in the middle right now, not only for uh, uh, the organization's players, but for him as the general manager. And look, the, 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 there's no question that ownership has trust in Doug Armstrong. There's no question he earned cachet by winning the first Stanley Cup in the franchise's history. But again, you know, you just look at that roster right now and you see all of the character, all of the skill, all of the things that left with guys like Petrangelo and Ryan O'Reilly that went out the door and and how he struggled to try to replace them. You know, one of the things about losing Petrangelo is that he tried to replace him by signing a bunch of guys that all kind of did things that he did, like parts of Petrangelo. You know, I, 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 I refer to it as sort of like Voltron leaves and then you go and sign a bunch of different lions, right? Like it's kind of okay. what he tried to do. And, and, and so it didn't work and the roster didn't work. They're not nearly as good as the other teams in the West. If they did get into the playoffs, it would just to be again, to be a first round buy for somebody. They've only won one playoff series since winning the cup. So just overall, I think it's, it's a problem with, with the management right now and, and maybe a full organizational change is, is in the, in the, in the wanting right now. So Craig Berube leaves the Blues with a 206, 131, and 44 record in parts of six seasons with the Blues. As I mentioned, second best points percentage by any coach in franchise history. He was there when the team won their very first Stanley Cup in history in 2019. What do you think Craig Berube's legacy will be as head coach of the Blues? I covered a lot of that cup run, and you know we all remember – Jordan Bennington kind of doing the stone cold uh, blood in his veins, winning a game seven on the road routine and, and how important that was that run. But for me, the reason the blues won the cup is because every time it felt like the wheels were wobbling on the wagon, every time they faced adversity in the playoffs and sometimes in, in cases where they got absolutely jobbed by a call, for example, it was always Craig Berube behind the bench and in press conferences and behind the scenes that kept them on an even keel. He had the right temperament for the moment. He was the right coach for the situation. And he kept them on track towards that destination the entire time. And they don't win without him. Uh, he was the perfect mm -hmm. guy for that <clears throat> moment, for that team. And, and, and that cup, his name's on the cup. It will always be on the cup as the St. Louis Blues coach. And it belongs there because he's the reason they won. Third coach to be let go this season, midseason, uh, Jay Woodcroft, Dean Evison, the other ones. Uh, let's see what happens in St. Louis. Speaking of the ESPN doubleheader that we had on Tuesday night, there was a really cool moment uh, that occurred during the Connorverse. Of course, the big storyline wish was Connor McDavid versus Connor Bedard. Today's superstar versus tomorrow's superstar and all the accoutrement that comes with that. But during the game itself, uh, the backup goaltender in that game for the Edmonton Oilers, Calvin Pickard, uh, wore a headset for us on the ESPN yeah. broadcast, uh, not just for a quick interview. This was for most of the period. I'm John Butchergrass with Ray Ferraro and in-game unpaid ESPN analyst, <laughs> backup goalie Calvin Pickard, who's with Ray. Good to be here. Thanks, guys. And I wanted to give a shout out uh, to John Butchergrass and Ray Ferraro, who conducted the conversation, and it was terrific. It was a magnificent listen. What does that look like to a goalie? Like the, the release, the quickness, the guys that shoot it different than everybody else. Yeah, honestly, this is the first time I saw, I've saw i seen Bedard, and, uh, you know, I think it was his first shift. He put a, put a nice shot upstairs there, but obviously playing with with Connor, uh, with Davo, um, every day in practice, he's moving a million miles an hour. You see it here first and when he plays in games, but I see it every day in practice, and it's, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a practice or game. It's it's great for me to play against him, and, and uh, you see why he, uh, he's so good. Also, the game producer was Doug Whitehorn, uh, who basically orchestrated all of this. This is not something that I'm used to seeing. I don't know if I've ever actually seen it before to this degree. A backup goaltender who really is, at, in that moment, very much a fan like us, right? Like, just a very privileged fan, obviously. He's part of the team. He's sitting there. He's watching the game like the rest of us, right? Yeah. But he's there, and he's talking. It really felt like uh, equal parts game interview, podcast, and analysis yeah. because it was almost like all three of those things were weaving itself into this great 
chat that all three of them were having. And even in certain points where Peter Morazic made a save for the Blackhawks, Calvin Pickard was mid-thought. He's like, oh, that was a nice save. Like he was commenting on the game itself while talking about fielding questions about his career, while talking about the state of the Oilers. And look, we know as hockey fans that goaltenders – tend to make great analysts on television, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. That There are countless examples. Look no further than our roster at ESPN. Uh, and, and also, we had Corey Schneider on uh, earlier this season on the drop, and now he's doing great things as a budding analyst in the hockey world, right? So we know this, but to see it in action in that way from an active goaltender on a roster that just happens to be the backup that night and sitting there and – the image of him and Ray Ferraro right beside each other, Ray at his post, Calvin Pickard at the end of the bench. Yeah. I would love to see more of this wish. I hope that this becomes an option for future broadcasts that we can explore because there are a lot of great goaltenders in the league uh, that would have really insightful and fun conversations. Yeah. And it gives you that kind of like flow of play conversation more so than, than our, you know, our colleagues, Leah Hextall and, and Emily Kaplan trying to grab a word from a coach during a timeout and it's rushed and he's not thinking about what they're talking about and it's all, you know, not in the moment. And, and so that, that kind of more casual vibe while also getting some insight from somebody on the team, I think is something we could definitely use more of in broadcast. I enjoyed it too. I thought it was really uh, the novel, the novelty of it, and 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 also the insight that we received during it was awesome. It was a nice time at Electronic Arts because the producer really was a god, and you know, you could do your own licensing, you you know, and and there was actually a pretty sophisticated system. I don't know if you remember the sound meter. There was logic that was based on what would happen in an arena and. The home ice advantage increased as you got the crowd louder and louder. So, so I loved, um, you know, building in these real features where it wasn't just the frills. It was actually there was a strategic part of of it, and you were getting feedback like, "What's the crowd meter at? Oh, wow! If I can get that higher, like." I have a better chance of, of scoring or my guys skate a little faster. You know, I love going to that level of, of detail because I just, I always had faith that real hockey fans are going to like figure this stuff out eventually and, and, and appreciate it. All right. So that was a clip from Michael Brook, who is a producer for EA Sports. Uh, certainly at the time, talking about one of the features for NHL 94, which really is considered the greatest hockey video game of all time, certainly best hockey retro video game of all time, and in the conversation for one of the best sports video games, period. And here to talk all about it is Danny O'Dwyer, who created an awesome NHL 94 documentary on Noclip, which is a crowdfunded video game film platform. To commemorate the game's 30th anniversary, it is called The Making of NHL 94 on YouTube. Danny joining us now on The Drop. Uh, this is a topic, Danny, that is near and dear to both of our hearts, Wish and I. Uh, so how did you uh, get involved with creating a documentary on NHL 94? Like, wh where does your love begin? Yeah, it's really funny. We got a we get a lot of pitches from different publishers and developers that say like, oh, you know, we have an anniversary coming up or we have a game that just came out. Do you want to do a documentary on it? And this one was very funny because it was a guy from EA. Like I'm Irish, right? So I, I didn't grow up like in a in a place where it was easy to watch NHL. <laughs> uh, so he sends me this email. He's like, I don't know if if this is like, are you going to care about this? But like NHL is turning 30 and we thought it would be cool. He didn't know that like also in Europe, NHL 94 was a huge deal for oh, people wow. who never had really played hockey games or certain. I'd never watched hockey on television. Um, hilariously, I think it was EA Hockey, which was the first one they made in yeah. 1992. That was in a pack with John Madden Football 92 on the Mega Drive, what was known as the Genesis over here. Yeah. It was in a two pack because they couldn't, you couldn't possibly ask Europeans to spend full price for either of those games. <laughs> so you got both of them. I'm like, they're so two here, here's of the, best the America pack? ever. It's like, here's the America sports pack. <laughs> <laughs> 
Exactly. So bet- <laughs> between those and NBA Jam, I think that's probably, they're probably more responsible for getting a lot of my generation of gamers into American sports. Yeah. The the doc is great. And, and it's great for those who want to nerd out about the the technical details and how these games are made, the ge- the, the generation of, of the ideas for the games. You go in depth with the producers of these games. What it, What was some of your favorite nuggets that you learned from the interviews that you did for the doc? Oh, my favorite part by a mile is the the secret uh, home ice advantage stuff that they had in there. So, you know, a lot of games are, you know, they they sort of do things behind the scenes without you knowing. Like NBA Jam will do a lot of like in the last couple of seconds of the game. If you go for like a long shot, you have a much higher chance of it going in than if you did it in, in the first quarter. And one of the coolest things that NHL 94 does is that they're basically like constantly taking the temperature of the home uh, uh, audience, the crowd. So whenever you like almost get a goal in, or if you have a breakaway, or if there's a fight or any of the, well, I guess there's no fights in 94, but if there's like a big <laughs> hit or something like that, um, the, the the audio, the sort of uh, the decibels in the, in, the, in the stadium, which they do show you in the menu, I just thought that was for color. I was like, oh, cool. They're just adding a cool bit of flavor. It's part of the broadcast package or whatever. But that actually made a difference. So if you took a shot and and you were playing at home and the crowd was riled up, the the more riled up they were, the higher the chance that that shot was going to go in or the higher the shot, the chance that a pass across the ice was going to get collected by one of your players. And it just, I love that because it's, we all, when you play these games, you have a sense that that's happening, like the story <laughs> of the match, right? And yeah. the psychology of sports is such an important part of like almost all sports. And I think to have that mirrored in the game just shows you how like it's not a simulation but it it goes a long way to making it feel like the real sport i'm glad you mentioned that by the way and nba jam one of the best trolls ever i know we're going on a tangent here but mark termel the creator of that game said you're right about the last second shot unless you are the bulls playing the Pistons <laughs> because he's a Pistons fan. So he specifically wrote the code so that the Bulls could never tie the Pistons ever <laughs> um, on a last second shot. And he did that out of spite because of those nineties Bulls teams, which is like the greatest thing ever. Um, w- speaking of, speaking of code, one of the famous things of NHL 94 is the weight bug code in Sega Genesis, which really birthed the juggernaut of Jeremy Roenick. Right. Like how, 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 how does that get handled in the documentary? We don't actually talk, talk about the Ronick stuff much at all. There's a really good um, fan made documentary that came out a number of years ago uh, where they actually interview him, which I thought was fantastic. Okay. Okay. He he obviously became such a, uh, even his career and his legacy was influenced so much by that in the same way that like, yeah, an NBA jam, like certain players or even Bill Clinton pops up in that game and yeah. people still talk about it. Um, so we didn't do that. We we tried to keep it a bit more technical because look, I love watching NHL now. And I grew up in Ireland where we grew, we grew up playing a game called hurling, which is in many ways, you know, somewhat similar to the pace of, uh, of hockey. Um, and I like the sport, but I'm no expert. So I, I tried to keep it as much as possible in the field that I understand, which is, the sort of nuts and bolts of how games are are designed but it's it's amazing that people still bring him up like uh like uh you know in an era like 30 years later it's still a story and it just goes to show how influential it's tiny little bugs like that can be you mentioned fighting and um there's a really interesting part of the doc that talks about like the earlier versions of the nhl games when it was back in like nhl pa uh back in the day and and sort of the the tap dancing around fighting that was happening between <laughs> rights holders and the league and the pa what, what, what was that part? what was that like it was amazing to hear all that stuff yeah they they obviously had fighting in the game originally and then i guess there was a press event at it was like the stanley cup uh, final or one of the playoffs and and the commissioner was there and they were like beating up players and he wasn't particularly uh, happy about it <laughs> and, and so that it ended up being a bone of contention, which is why it was NHLPA 93, because they got the rights with the players. Also, apparently, uh, whoever owned the rights uh, had never told the NHLPA when they made EA Hockey, so they were pretty sour about that as well. And then I guess (laughs) they had to make the call with 94 of whether or not they wanted the NHL license or whether they or not they wanted to, to have the fights. And 
you know, it's it's the one asterisk on 94 is that later games had fighting, earlier uh, games had fighting. And whether or not the fighting is something like, you know, I'm sure, you know, you guys are hockey fans and I'm sure there's a lot of like conversations about fighting right over the generations and how much part of the sport it is and X and Y and all that sort of stuff. From a gameplay perspective, it's such it's such an important part of those games because yeah. not only does it like sort of create an entirely new game within the game, but that whole heat system I was talking about before, they had this whole thing in NHL 94 where like if the home ice is getting this advantage and all that like temperatures building up and, and they're getting all that advantage. You can negate that by like bashing into one of their players and having the audience basically burn out all their enthusiasm on a fight. Uh, so it, it wow. would have become a gameplay consideration. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad that they took it out, but from a sort of storytelling perspective, I found it very interesting. And I think every good game needs to have an asterisk. Uh, you know, nothing's perfect, right? There's always something to improve. And obviously in 95 and 96, they got a lot of that stuff back in. Um, and that's why we have the conversation about which, why is it 94 is the one that a lot of people say is the best. Some say it's 93, some say it's 95. And that's sort of uh, the fights are a big part of that. So actually, let's expand on that because you mentioned how technical your documentary is, right? A lot of people also point to 94 because it was the introduction of the one timer. Uh, and then obviously, like Wish said, it was the merger of the NHL and the NHL Players Association from a like a like a guts of the creation of the game standpoint and the evolution of the game itself where does 94 land in terms of like hockey games of that era i th i think it is the best one for a couple of reasons i think first of all game development is is very tricky and designing games you often don't get it right first time. So you kind of need to iterate on it. It's like, you know, musicians with albums or anything, right? Or even like a, a good sports team. They need years to gel and kind of figure out what it's all about. And 94 was them sort of perfecting a lot of the ideas that worked, getting rid of some of the stuff that didn't. Uh, and then they had this amazing programmer and Mark Lesser, who, you know, despite not really understanding the rules of hockey when he started on the project, um, kind of new people and new sports and new psychology and was able to like add in a lot of flavor uh, into 94. I also think that like audience expectation is another part of this. I think when you had like big sports like Madden and you had like, you know, NBA jam and those types of thing, uh, hockey obviously doesn't have the sort of like massive audience that a lot of those sports enjoy. Um, and I think as a result, the games that were made that were hockey games were to that point, not the most played or most exciting ones. They didn't get the most resources. And by the time 94 came along, there was all this buzz around EA hockey and NHL PA 93. The 94 was the one that sort of broke it into the mainstream and did so with an audience that wasn't expecting it to be that good. And that's the problem is that the next year they expect it to be that good. So NHL 95 uh, is a terrific game, but I just think there was something about the magic of that initial, like, Oh, you need to, you need to play this hockey game. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't watch NHL. And it was like, no, 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 don't worry about it. You need to play this game. It's really good in the same way that breakthrough games like, you know, NBA jam did the same thing for basketball. So for me, I think it's that. Um, although my favorite part of the documentary is maybe the end where, Mark Lesser uh, sort of uh, decides that the reason why N NHL 94 was the, the best of the lot was because there was something going on in Maine with the uh, the local college team that was having, Bears. Its, yeah. Yeah, it's having its best year ever and in 94, and he was just down the road from the college. So maybe it was Maine uh, magic, you know? It, it is interesting, though, like the idea of like non-hockey people being behind one of the most iconic hockey games of all time it reminds me of like, Tim Burton saying he he wasn't a comic book guy when he directed Batman. Like right. it, it, you know, it, it takes sometimes an outsider to bring in a little bit of that 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 vibe and that feel that might not be there if it was a bunch of hockey obsessives making it. One of my favorite things in the doc is actually when the guy who is uh, creating the player ratings is just like throwing numbers at these guys and then getting feedback from the hockey people being like, no, that is completely wrong. This person should not be this good. And that and and it's it's a really funny part of the doc. Last question for me. Um, you know, the, the thing that I've always found about the, the 94 in particular, why people keep on coming back to it is the simplicity of it. You know, later games, and you cover this in the doc, 
the graphics got better, but the gameplay got more confusing and jankier and, and, and not as fun. And, and as we've gone through the EA series, they've gone and revisited the style and the gameplay of, of 94 and 93 and 95 to get back to kind of that fun user experience. And I, it was, was it just a snapshot in time? Did they lose the thread at some point and forget what made these games fun? <laughs> Yeah, it's it, what happened really was in in the mid '90s because 3D graphics became you know the the next big thing, right? Screenshots in magazines and video on television, it just looked incredible, and we never seen games like that. But what you were basically asking is people who had made two dimensional games to suddenly make this entirely different type of piece of software, right? Yeah. So all the early 3D stuff was very you know the people just trying to figure it out so a lot of those early 3d games not just in nhl but like across the board you had a lot of studios just disappear overnight because they weren't able to make that transition you know it's like asking a carpenter who had made you know doors their whole life to suddenly you know make cabinets and you're like oh, well <laughs> I, I i've trained in doors my whole life so <laughs> i think that's a big part of it and then also you you hit on a really good point which is that simple games and even back then people would say you know if they were playing if you handed it to your parents and they're like what is this controller it's got multiple buttons obviously these days the controllers have way more buttons but even then it was wasn't exactly easy to pick up and play for some people but simple games you know simple design doesn't age good game design doesn't age it's the reason why we still do jigsaws it's the reason why chess yeah. is still popular like yeah. just because things get more complicated doesn't necessarily mean that they sort of spread or have that mainstream appeal. And NHL 94 is just a perfect little game. You know, you pass with one button, you shoot with another button, and then you intuit the rest of it. And especially for a sports game, because sports are complicated things. They have esoteric rules that, you know, are complicated. I understood, I never watched an NHL game when I was playing that game. I understood what icing was. I understood what offsides were wow. based on the game. The game there was you like go. able to communicate it. Okay. Um, so I think like the in many ways, like you said, it was a marriage of people who understood the sports, people who were maybe outsiders who were able to empathize with folks who didn't understand the sport and making something that was simple and worked great and appealed to people outside of the sport and people within the sport. And that is that is a razor fine line to do in games. So Danny O'Dwyer created a documentary called The Making of NHL 94. People can find it on YouTube right now. Yeah, it's on our NoClip YouTube channel. If you type NoClip into uh, YouTube, you'll find us. Or just type NHL 94 and you'll you'll see the thumbnail. Danny O'Dwyer joining us here on The Drop. A little dose of nostalgia. You'll love it. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Connor McDavid was hard at work off the ice revamping the NHL All-Star <laughs> Skills Competition. Apparently, he has his fingerprints all over this thing, Greg Wyshynski. Tell us about the overhaul of the Friday event of All-Star Weekend. It's. I think it's really cool. So for those who haven't seen it, the, the skills competition now, the field has been narrowed to 12 players, okay? It's going to be eight players selected by the NHL, the NHLPA, four players the fans vote in from the all-star player pool. Uh, it's only going to be eight events. Everybody's going to uh, do four of the first six events, which are your traditional hockey events, hardest shot, you know, accuracy, all that stuff. The whole point of it is to kind of like reorient skills back towards hockey skills and away from, oh, I don't know, dunk tanks <laughs> and shooting the puck from the fountains of Bellagio, which again, were buzzworthy, but maybe the players didn't feel as comfortable doing it. Um, the McDavid of it all is really interesting. I talked to Steve Mayer from the NHL. You can read the article on, e on ESPN.com. Uh, the, the league kind of went to McDavid as a sounding board and said, here's what we're thinking about for skills. Uh, what's your input? What skills do you think make for the best all-around NHL player? And, and was kind of looking for his endorsement along the way as to being on the right path towards revamping skills. And McDavid had a lot of input in what you're ultimately going to see at the All-Star game. Um, it's a points-based thing. The, the, better, the better you do at these events, the more points you accumulate. Uh, it, it, you start to lose and eliminate players. You get to the seventh event and then the eighth event. The eighth event's what's called the NHL Obstacle Course, which is basically like all of the other events, but in smaller versions. The seventh event, is the thing that has me really excited, Arda. 
Um, a lot of people through the years have talked about the concept of what if playoff teams could pick their first round opponents? That's always been kind of the bell. My friend Jeff <laughs> Merrick was always a real big yeah. advocate of what if a playoff team could pick their first round opponent? I don't know if we'll ever get there, but this might be the closest we get to it, which is what if a skater in a shootout had a, had his choice of eight different all-star goalies and got to pick which goalie he wanted to shoot on. The player with the fewest amount of accumulated points by the seventh event is going to be the guy who gets to pick first which of the eight all-star goalies he wants to shoot against. I think that is dope. I think that is going to add so much kayfabe drama to the proceedings <laughs> of like, you know, does does a does a, a flame pick an oiler? You know, does does a guy pick his teammate? Like that whole thing is going to be really, really fun to watch when we get to that event, I think. First of all, I am not picking Pyotr Kochetkov. I'll tell you that. Much. <laughs> oh my God! Based on his I don't know. check on Brady Kachuk. If you're Brady, if you're Brady Kachuk, you might pick him. But I don't think that, Kachuk will oh, the All Star game. Personally. That would be drama. If that, imagine that situation. Yes, that's the only. That would be the choice. Yes, you are right. correct. Brady Kachuk picking Pyotr Kochetkov for revenge in the All Star game be would incredible. be hilarious. Be incredible. Yes, agreed. Yeah. I, I love that. That is that is really cool. Here's a thought. So I love the counsel of McDavid for the overall system of this. Mm -hmm. If the city-specific events, the Bellagio Fountain, the um, uh, pucks against the cards, um, what happened in Florida? Uh, hockey uh, golf. The theme, the hockey golf, right. Yeah. If that is not the way to go in the future, if the players are not necessarily jazzed about it, it looked cool on TV, but if the players are not jazzed about it, what if every year for a certain part of the All-Star game, one of the All-Stars or players or stars from the host city team has that sort of input? What if they are reached out to and said, how would you customize the all-star game? And that becomes Brady Kachuk's thing, Austin Matthews's thing, uh, Sasha Barkov's thing, whatever. Yeah. Like, I think that a player involvement to that degree, like I'm excited that Connor McDavid has got this input. And yeah, to me, it sure. opens the door for stars around the league to, to sprinkle some of their spice every all-star game yeah I, it's not a bad idea and, and in fact um you and i are both fans i think of like the weird stuff like the, the dunk sure. tank was super fun you know it was yeah. like that's the buzzy thing and and i don't think the players necessarily hated doing it right um so the good news is that those events are still going to happen down the line steve mayor from the nhl told me that since this is going to be limited to 12 players you have dozens of other players that are all stars that are have nothing to do on Thursday on the Friday night. So uh, the thought is down the line, maybe you include some of the players that aren't in the live skills competition in some of those taped events uh, elsewhere, which is really oh, cool. Um, cool. So that's a possibility. Oh. I like, I like your idea. I think it's good. Um, and, and I, I love the idea of more player involvement in crafting the all-star game. Uh, so the more the merrier I say. That does it for us here on The Drop. Thank you very much for listening. Every Tuesday, Thursday, wherever you get your audio podcasts, as well as the NHL on ESPN YouTube. Enjoy the weekend of hockey, and we'll catch you on Tuesday. 